Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us. This is Size of Thoughts, Conversations with the Alliance of History graduate students. I'd like to emphasize that the things that you will hear over the next hour are solely the, the views of the producer, which is myself, Jacob Glicklick, as well as the guest, making them so that everything that we say are solely the, our views and represent us in Size of Thoughts. They do not in any way represent River West Radio, so therefore River West Radio should not be held liable for anything that we, we, you might hear over the next hour. So thanks for joining in, either, either catching it either live or in the archive. Uh, in case you are listening to this live, I'm going to take a brief moment to plug the up, this upcoming event. Uh, as maybe you've probably heard that uh, Derek Williams was a young man who died in police custody during in July 2011, uh, more over the last two months since the release of the video showing his last moments of his life and how he had died in the police van while, call, while begging for help. There have been a number of uh, community events and marches uh, each Sunday. Sunday. The next one coming up is Sunday, 1 o'clock, um, um, starting at uh, so this is uh, November 25th, start, starting at 9th and Ring. So I guess uh, it's better asking anyone to be there in terms of support, members of the family, Occupy the Hood, Milwaukee, Ave, and other you know, churches and community groups. So, in any case, I uh, hope, hope to see you there. But more broadly, the, the, uh, for tonight, I am joined by first time guest and fellow graduate student, Michael Gusick. Hi, Jacob. How are you? And uh, Michael is one of the many doctoral uh, students to come come through and, sort of, and talk about research. Though he is the first in terms of uh, priest to you know bring on the show. But um, so yeah, perhaps one of the, asking in terms of how some of the in terms of our shift or what or what or what are you from from, sort of from in terms of clerical life of it to you know, academia or some or some connections or disconnection right. disconnects there. Um, and it might explain my interest in the Russian Catholic Church. <laughs> that might be part of it. So on that, I yeah, I largely want to you know use this next hour to you know chat about your research and then we've talked about it sort of, sort of well not not over air to our you know attentive audience of dozens, uh, <laughs> but uh, instead you know maybe just in terms of hearing a bit more about uh, what you're studying and what led you to the project. So I mean I currently I don't want to like pin down too much. Sure. Since, I mean not that, even, that'll not, come yeah, later. Yeah, not, I mean still doing still doing coursework, not yet dissertator, um, you right. know, not yet everything locked in stone, which is you know, probably all the better for it, um, okay. but what at present say is the general direction of your work? Well, I came actually wanting to do a dissertation on uh, the Father General of my order, the Jesuits, uh, Father Letohovsky. Uh, he was a pretty ardent patriot and the head of the Jesuit order um, during the interwar period, and that seemed exciting to me, and um, when I got here, well, why I came to UWM was uh, Professor Neil Pease had written this book, Rome's Most Faithful Daughter, and it touched on a lot of the themes that I was interested in, and I liked his approach, and I liked the uh, way that he dealt with uh, the archival material and so forth. So we were talking about po a possible project, and he mentioned uh, a Jesuit whom I never heard of um, named Michel Derbigny, a French Jesuit who was one of those typical sort of French-educated uh, people of the um, interwar period that was a Russophile, and in terms of his formation as a Jesuit, it led him to be interested in uh, Russia, and as the Orthodox Church collapsed uh, with the, and the Bolsheviks uh, um, seized power in um, Russia, he saw an opportunity to um, evangelize, well, really proselytize. And the story is kind of a convoluted story in terms of um, his dismissal. He was very influential in the Vatican and um, also had the misfortune of creating a lot of, a lot of his own problems. And he was unceremoniously dismissed in 1933, which uh, the reasons for the actual dismissal are, are disputed. Uh, Neil Pease describes him as both obscure and disputed. And it, the reasons range everywhere from him having a girlfriend, which is sort of a weak kind of, I think, argument, uh, but one that a, a, a historian hired by the family to clear his name focused on. Um, it's sort of, I guess, like insult to injury. So, you know, you have the cleric and you're displeased with him. Not only is he a bad guy, but he's got a girlfriend too, right? So there's some of that, but the more plausible um, theories are really concerned his conduct in terms of the um, international arena, the diplomatic um, circle, and his conduct also within the Vatican. So, you know, there are stories like he would say things like, um, 
ask the Polish foreign minister what the probability would be to be able to parachute uh, priests or really Catholics into Russia at a diplomatic event and the Soviet ambassadors can overhear that. So he was a little reckless. Uh, and at the same time, he also, um, with the Polish connection with uh, Pope Pius IX, also had a, um, they had a connection in the sense of um, having a, a personal um, interest and experience of, of the, the so-called East. And so Pius IX really trusted him, and uh, Derbeni used that to his personal advantage. But, you know, as with any institution, um, it was found out that, you know, the views he expressed uh, weren't necessarily his own. They were not the views of the Pope as he purported. And so he made quite a few enemies. And so by September 1933, um, the, um, well, uh, people had had enough. Um, so the probably the most plausible theory is that the Marshal of Poland, uh, Pilsudski, Marshal Pilsudski had um, contacted uh, Wojciech Ladochowski, the Jesuit Father General, to have him dismissed. Uh, so I'm, that's plausible. And the last uh, biographer, which who was writing in 1979, um, really surmises a lot of this, but he doesn't have the uh, evidence in front of him. Um, it's really by inference. So I'm going to try to nail down the exact um, contours of the of the of his dismissal, and hopefully lead out then to um, you know issues in terms of how the Vatican operates internally, uh, what that means in terms of politics and ideology in Eastern and East Central Europe. But, um, you know, it's sort of a dangerous historical project. In a way, I'm looking for a smoking gun, and I hope I find it. <laughs> it's, it's said earlier, you cited, uh, you know, because in this kind of being both, you know, like charged and obscure particular story. So, I mean, which seems like it could describe, you know, any number of uh, historiographical yeah. issues that are, that, you know, can become in terms of, of, of tangled and, you know, in terms of heated general discussion, but not necessarily that much wider, wider spread. And, um, but I guess in this context, since, I mean, yeah, okay, probably like well, you know, like how how measure like, like or how or how obscure or like or how essential and and well, and, and, and and I guess also you know insofar as this kind of this kind of is like told. I mean, it, what yeah. what are they the, the main tendencies of like how this incident or the or the, maybe the whole the whole larger period that covers this incident are described you know by okay. the Vatican by Polish nationalists by sure I mean, I mean other other brands of like scholarships or people who do have like I guess some kind of stake involved in telling about this period right um, well I think um, firstly um, Michel Derbigny was a um, uh, in a way, he was confident, maybe overconfident, in his abilities. And um, people, at least from the Vatican side, um, look at the relations of the Vatican with Soviet Russia and Russia really in two, uh, there are two moments, really. Uh, maybe the first theme would be the diplomatic theme, which they, they don't have uh, diplomatic relations with, official diplomatic relations with Soviet Russia. They have to go through the German embassy, so things are indirect. So there's that move, and Germany's involved in that. and. Certainly, then, as the church is trying to settle um, uh, their relationship with the newly created states after the First World War in terms of creating concordance and all, concordats, excuse me, and all of that, you know, there's a sense of, you know, in terms of the local national governments watching what the Vatican is going to do. Poland probably seizes f first. Uh, that's one of the earlier concordats. I, I don't remember the, the date. Um, it's also for the fact that it's early and maybe more quickly done was um, Neil Peace points out that it um, there was many problems and um, ambiguities left in it so in terms of the how the church is going to operate and what it's going to look like diplomatically in Eastern Europe is um, unclear and uh, the other avenue which seems to be the maybe the sexier more popular um, approach is to tell the story about the you know the Vatican Vatican espionage where mm. um, Derbigny had uh, made two or three clandestine trips into the Soviet Union as a means of uh, trying to plant the seeds of this Russian Catholic Church that would supplant the both then the uh, Orthodox Church that had fallen, and then you know they had assumed in the Vatican that the Bolshevik Revolution wasn't going to last, so they were sort of betting on uh, the the fall of the Bolshevik government, and then you would be able to have this sort of um, Greek Catholic Church. The older term is uniate, but um, Greek Catholics actually find that offensive. So, you know, you see it all over the 
historiography or the histories. Um, but it's it's a term that at least in theological circles is is frowned upon. Um, so, on the one hand, you have the view of Derbigny uh, from the the church side, which is then um, addressed from either diplomatic diplomatic issues or more probably more popularly um, espionage. You know, he he snuck in and um, just as a um, kind of a, a little story about that that he. Um, I think it was his visit in 25 where he walks out the back door of the hotel in a in this um, sort of overcoat and he's not followed and he thinks that he's give, given people the slip, um, but he hasn't. So the NKVD um, basically follows him and um, they follow him to the church where he um, ordained or consecrated uh, uh, some bishops. They followed him around Soviet Russia and met all of the people that are about the identities of all the people that he met, so they pretty effectively rooted out um, that effort. So the sort of the clandestine, maybe maybe less espionage, but maybe better clandestine. The clandestine efforts of Derbigny were a, a rough failure, um, and I would say partly due to his arrogance that mm -hmm. you know he really thought that he had given you know these professional police the slip. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Yeah, it would uh, seem that that uh, yeah, dealing with the NKVD, right. everything of it, that yeah, wouldn't right. wouldn't wouldn't would pay to pay to right. be some, some, somewhat more kind right. of you know cautious yeah. or to, or uh, yeah. multiple levels. Right. So, so, like, so but um, yes, yeah, I mean, right. so, so, so that's yeah. I mean, that's the that's the church side. So then you know you'd asked about maybe some of the other the other side. Well, you know because the Russian Catholic Church then isn't going to be. Um, created and planted on Russian soil that ends up being um, or in a way seeking refuge in eastern Poland and right here um, in this area it's really it takes root in a lot of uh, Belarusian territory and with the Tsarist um, effort I think it was 1837 but you know I'm an historian I don't really keep the dates that well I think it, anyway the 1830s the uh, or the um, Greek Catholic churches were closed and incorporated into um, the, you know, the buildings and property and so forth, incorporated into the Orthodox Church. So, at least Belarusian nationalists at the end of the 19th century would claim, you know, the uh, their church was this uh, Greek Catholic church which had been taken away. Now suddenly, here here's a a new creation that's not run by the Ukrainian Metropolitan in in Lviv, um, uh, Andrei Sheptitsky. And so, you know, in a way, they have a, an opportunity to, in a way, have their church. And conveniently, you know, it's um, the Byzantine Slavonic, right? It's all of the stuff that would resonate with Belarusian nationalists. Now, given the uh, difficulty in Poland in terms of, you know, nationalist politics, especially um, Pilsudski was a bit more, um, actually quite a lot more tolerant in terms of wanting to create a federal multi-ethnic uh, state where one's allegiance, uh, one one's uh, identity as being Polish wouldn't be identified with one's ethnicity so much as loyalty to a state. Um, that was probably not as popular as the prevailing, you know, ethno-national trends uh, symbolized by the Indetsia, where one's nationality was uh, marked by, you know, ethnicity and language. So. Um, in terms then of how this functions within uh, Poland, the the Russian Catholic Church is a um, it's a domestic policy problem in terms of minority relations, and um, I haven't found any any historian so far that thought that the Polish government did a good job with its minority relations. Mm -hmm. They were it was a pretty much a failure. Everyone that I've read so far will put a disclaimer. Everyone that I've read so far sees it as a as a, a failure to a different to de varying degrees and part of that was the fact that this Russian Catholic Church could be a locus for sort of um, national in a way Belarusian national performance so um, that's really um, so suddenly the, then the conduct of the, my uh, the subject of my dissertation uh, Michel Derbigny has sort of uh, it's uh, there's an unfolding difficulty in terms of you know, power politics in the Vatican, diplomatic issues, domestic policies, you know, really right down to a grass, grassroots level. So part of the fun of trying to sort through this is figuring out, you know, how am I going to try to construct some sort of meaning in this dismissal? Because if I can link it to 
Ledahovsky acting, acting at the behest of Marshal Pilsudski, well, you know, suddenly now national interests make their way, they, they're, they're felt in the Vatican. Yeah. You know, yeah, and th- along with some of the internecine uh, uh, fights that are going on among cardinals in terms of who's got access to the Pope and all that kind of business that comes with, you know, pursuit of power. Yeah, that's, you know, there's a number of broader, like, implications of it. I mean, it's been a while since I've read Pieces' book, but uh, what I recall when I did, I mean, was that, I mean, just showing, I mean, sort of like, I mean, it's like how complicated the notion of national identity became, particularly yeah. for, I mean, like well, I say for like, oh, it, it's in virtually any nation, but um, within... But I mean, particularly for the rec- a recreation of it, that in some cases, well, like that, that's when you know, all the difficult part begins for all the people who do the cherish do the dream of reviving Poland right. and once more, then have to actually figure out what that means right. means in any sense. And right. yeah, so I mean, the issues and they certainly like problematic to say the least yeah. in terms um, of dealings with minority ethnic groups of, groups within it. It seems it is yeah. Yeah, even one, impl- one implication, but even for the majority or for the sort of dominant group. I don't know. I mean, yeah. it, I mean, as you just like, touched on a few times, it seems it seems yeah. like the individual egos and personalities made a yeah. sort of tremendous issue. But I wonder how much more just a some sense is like you know just inherently tangled and inherently paradoxical effort to create a con- you know firm continuity of Polishness that would that right. would sort of function. Right, and I think um, you know a lot of the work that's been done recently. Um, shows that you know the in the sense of the early modern concept of nationality uh, doesn't there's not a, a direct link of continuity between the early modern and then modern nationalism right the modern national idea is constructed Timothy Snyder deals with that extensively um, Keely um, Holster Stout um, you know, I just I've I've just blinked on her name. We just read um, in Professor Chu's class a book on the formation of national consciousness uh, in the Galician peasant. Uh, I just actually picked up a book um, on the f- creation of Independence Day as a symbol of Polish nationality, which deals a little bit more with themes of continuity, not because. Uh, uh, the, there's this genealogical continuity, uh, but because the schlock to the Polish nobility um, form the core of an intelligentsia, and that's carried through in terms of uh, Marshal Pilsudski's um, legions, of all things. So, um, yeah, there are problems, and you know, this fight between what it means to be Polish, whether it's Polish blood and language versus uh, in a way, a uh, translated romantic connection to the Commonwealth. Um, there's no middle ground in a lot of ways, and uh, some of the Polish historians uh, cl- uh, describe that as a, the moral clash of nations. Um, and you know, in this way, uh, then the say the reconstructed state uh, in 1918. Um, then the Polish identity is in competition in some ways, or in many ways, with Ukrainian and Belarusian, Lithuanian, Jewish, German, even to a small degree Czech identities. You know, so you know, there aren't any neat ethnic lines, you know, and that's you know, that's true everywhere, but I think even more so uh, looking at some of these uh, maps that were uh, assembled in the teens and in the end of the 19th century in terms of ethnic distribution however that's done it's um no matter how you slice it it's a pretty messy um it's a pretty messy pot and maybe uh, i guess drawing back even a little further from this um in terms of the question of re- reconstructed reconstructed nationalism and its yeah. challenges i mean maybe elaborate i guess like the sense like a sense of continuity that was either like felt or was like trying to force the feeling that feeling i mean if i were the polish nationalist uh, in 1933 or in 1918 for that matter i mean in thinking uh, or like or like teaching interviewing the classrooms of, of the story of the last okay. se- several centuries i mean what would their what would be the kind of like the key uh you know, s- s- symbols or events or processes that sort of would most would would be the sort of like mainstream nationalist okay. identifier yeah he, um yeah that's pretty straightforward um probably probably the earliest would be the may 3rd um date of the um 
and the, the, the so-called May Constitution of 1791. And the Poles are very proud to say that, you know, that's the first um, written constitution in Europe. It's the second, you know, after the, uh, the Constitution of the United States. But it symbolizes a, really a failure that um, the, the ratification of this uh, constitution on May 3rd, you know, prompts the military action by um, Russia and Prussia uh, that will eventually um, uh, partition the country. Al along with that, then, you have the the failed uh, efforts of uh, Tadeusz Kościuszko, who was also involved in the American uh, revolutionary movement, uh, mobilizing the peasants, right? So even though there's not a sense of modern nationality, the fact that in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, they can look back and see, uh, you know, really a Polish nobleman mo mobilizing peasants at the behest of, you know, Polish, um, Polish interests, you know, is something they'll point to. Um, also, um, there's a really, it's, in a lot of ways, it's, it's a story of failed insurrections. So 1795, 1830, 1863. Um, and so, these are the, uh, unfortunately, right, these are the, uh, the symbols of Polish uh, nation, nation, nationality, and they're all connected to failure. Well, I mean, the failed insurrections can be the most, you know, power, most powerful, most successful imagination of any house. I mean, yeah. because, I mean, those are the ones that, you're, in some cases, yeah. cases, if revolutionaries, you know, died heroically before they right. sold out or gained, you know, right. partial gains. I mean, yeah. I, I, for my, I mean, some of the, even irritancy, I mean, that the, of the one true Irish Republic is the the 1916 right, right. one that had five given blocks uh, around Dublin before it was right. shelled by the British because you know it was it, it was the inspiring point that that uh, unlike you know, other ones that you know, sort of succeeded more problematically and more, and more partially. Right, I think mean, you're yeah, right. You know, yeah, there's yeah, something yeah. romantic in failure, and which <laughs> seems inherently tied to nationalism as well. Since, yeah. since I mean, you can say that the nation that you that they get is always you know somewhat incomplete, or it's not, or it's not, it's not the Besieged full nation that that was that was suffering. It's not, support, it's yeah. not as you know, in terms of large or as successful or as dominant or, or imagined more positively, you know, as egalitarian or as idealistic or as just leadership as, you know, we're hoping or like seemed possible for, I mean, generations or, I mean, for, for centuries as, yeah. you know, in Polish, I mean, did exist as uh, in, you know, in terms of uh, un, uh, disenfranchised and dominated by other groups. Yeah. And, and I recall the other... But the kind of thing that struck me when I was reading Chase's book is that it seemed the interwar Poland, particularly a number of similarities with uh, post World War II Israel, really in term in terms of both a sense of a in terms of nationalism that had a you know long legacy, but um, also you know, a period of not I mean actual independent political existence you know, sudden, you know fa fairly suddenly reviving right. um, both as a major movement and then as an actual institution of be of having significant just internal debates of what sh the shape of the nation should take as well and as well having the sense sense of uh, conflict and hostility and extra General pressure that leads to, I mean, in very, in very, in fairly different ways, but you know, like sort of very strong military focus and very strong by sort of like the martial values yeah. inside society, and also, you know, unfortunately, I mean, the ma major in terms of problems and abuse done towards minority ethnic populations. In that sense, that the fact that I mean, the seems the biggest irony here that the image of the Jews is one of the most, yeah. you know, mo mo most fertilized groups within Poland. That, um, I mean, the contemporary. That has in terms of the Palestinians and with interviews as, yeah. as domination. I mean, does that, does that seem like? A, I mean, to, to some extent, I mean, it's a gross generalization, and there's yeah. of course enorm, en, enormous variations. But other yeah, enough, I mean, enough kind of like parallels. I mean, more more so than any. You could, I think they would be that would be an intriguing research avenue. Um, I mean, obviously the Poles would be very sensitive about, about yeah, as, this. Yeah, as, as would the Israelis. Israelis. Yeah, as in the Israelis. Uh, I could probably, you know. Um, in a sense that really maybe the question would be is uh, Polish nationality in its essence then anti-Semitic or are there Poles who are anti-Semitic in the nation? Oh you know, I think that might be the nuance because on the one hand the Indezio, you know, the anti-Semitic uh, uh, the program of anti-Semitic was an intrinsic part of the program uh, 
uh, but Pilsudski, there were a lot of Jewish, uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, Jewish groups that supported Pilsudski, and as uh, say November 11th was. Um, adopted as a replacement for the earlier holidays of failure that this is now finally one thing as you point out there's some sort of martial success now uh, that there's a chance for a future and November 11th and Pilsudski represents that there were Jewish groups that that supported him and participated throughout the 20s and 30s in uh, in in those public performances of patriotism and considered themselves Poles and were recognized at least by the Pilsudskiites as as Poles. But you know we also know that there's uh, plenty of anti-Semitism and violence um, along with that. And you could say probably the same in the early modern experience, where on the one hand there were the edicts of toleration, and Jews were invited into Poland and you know left Spain in you know the 1490s for Poland because it was ostensibly more tolerant. And at the same time there are pogroms. You know. Um, I'm less and less. Um, I think there's something to your your your, your parallels. Um, I'm just leery about. Um, I'm less enamored with that. You know, mm. I'm at least in this stage in my own research. I'm more enamored yeah. by ambiguity than sure. I am by. And, and, and by, uh, I'm quite sure that it's not the closest comparison. That in part means. I mean, but it's. it's, a, it's I think it's, it's a fair it's, one. It's, 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 it's also, by fact, of simply I'm much more familiar with Israeli history than with Polish. So, yeah. it's a sense of you know, all you have are nails. You know, everything looks like a hammer. Is yeah. As a form of connection, but I mean, also it seems that. I mean might either ways to even like broaden for like think of like I mean the nationalism and racial exclusion which I mean seems that in some, in some cases is fairly intrinsically linked I mean in, in different ways in different societies I mean but it seems that I mean if, as if since the nation state and nationalist ideologies have certain push it, pressures towards conformity and towards like expected of what you know people are respected. I mean, it seems that well, you know, generally, except in like the most uh, psychotic forms of nationalism, there's you know, over recent centuries, the idea of, a, of that you know, the loyal, patriotic, contributing individuals can participate. Um, you know, but it's, in part, it seems it's you know, it's still individuals that, to some extent, you know, like submerge or at least are willing to hold their identity as. Polish as Amer as American as French, yeah. as, you know, sort of as the primary, and so that that means that you know large large minority ethnic populations that you know have distinct sense of sort of communities and ways of navigating the world. I mean, seem yeah. that that seem that they come into conflict, um, yeah. and since if the mainstream nation state has disproportionate force and ability to pose well of it. It's not... Yeah. It's, 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 I guess in that, in that, in that sense, it's... Uh, I mean, I don't want to say that it's sort of inevitable, but in the sense that it doesn't, you know, in terms of excuse or, like, or, like, or justify the direct, you know, in terms of violence and anti-Semitism, you know, the anti-Palestinian acts of it. But in some senses, it does seem partly structural that... Yeah. Well, I think that it depends on, again, the... You have uh, two strains in, in interwar Poland, right? The uh, the Pilsudski position, where Poland is something akin to American. You can be Afro-American, Polish-American, German-American. That there was room for ethnic diversity. Um, on the other hand, you had um, the position of the Mofskiites, the Indetsia, where um, it, it's not an exact parallel, but the idea of a melting pot that one takes um, the uh, foreign element and either expunges it or uh, assimilates it and that seems to have been in many ways at least on, on a popular level um, the more um, the more compelling or the more uh, the more the wide, more widely accepted view so you know maybe there is something about that um, yeah, which also, in the case of it, we wouldn't be even just linked, to, limited to Poland, since I mean, in that period, I mean, we also, I mean, think, you know, certainly, yeah, well, certainly Germany. Well, there's plenty of blame to go around. Germany I mean, you've got the but, but, yeah, Lithuanians and, yeah. and the Ukrainians also um, mm. um, acting similarly. Yeah, right? but also the same thing that in that range of it, even in you know, the context of like the uh, like American, but well, the vision of racial tolerance or or, or the or acceptability meant, um, which I think has always meant you know, much less pretending. But also, I mean, around period 1920s was we saw the greatest flourishing of the Klan. So I mean, yeah. and in some cases the 
impact of the wartime experience and the emphasis on 100% American. I mean, even though the you know, U.S. civilian population was touched, you know, very little directly by by the conflict at all. Uh, there, you know, nativist sentiment was, I guess, not not small and not quiet, and it, it doesn't seem that in it, in its most kind of virulently, unambiguously ugly form seemed to you know indicate that there that there was just a lot of potential for. Uh, Mass, for, for sort of like mass violence and overt, I mean, efforts yeah. in, in, in either expelling uh, you know other you know, sort of, you know, undesirable populations or keeping them intimidated enough that they you know, were not were not seeking to assert themselves prominently in public life. Yeah. I'm not sure the the, nat- the comments on nativism would necessarily. Uh, translate well for, because, um, like the clan here is operating within a country that has, in a way, secure borders, right? Um, see the shining sea, uh, so to say, right? Uh, but in 1918, you know, um, uh, November of 1918, you have essentially areas where German and German troops are laying down arms. There's no territory. It has to be won in that sense. And that's the some of the legacy that in terms of the uh, plebiscites in the border with Germany and then this Polish-Soviet war that sets the eastern boundary. It's a um, it's hard to have a nativism functioning when even the territory that you're claiming is is disputed. <laughs> and I guess yeah, there's not an issue before about like how the you know, Polish nationalists at the time would have seen like the chronological you know scope of it. I mean, how often do they see like the spatial? I mean, in in, in the sense of I mean, there's often uh, pretty, uh, it's pretty clear that yeah. spatially um, they want the 1772 borders, and that's the sure. ideal. Uh, but the more astute politicians realize that that's not going to happen. So then um, the question is that uh, what is it that we, how much of the former uh, territory can be quote unquote salvaged and, and sort of reclaimed? Um, you have then the opposite view, say, with Lord Curzon talking about a minim- um, the minimalist position in terms of what's going on at the Versailles Conference. So what, what territory is indisputably Polish, right? Because it's, you know, we're saying this, this huge ethnic mix. Uh, and unfortunately, the the situation is solved by um, by war. You know the Polish Soviet War and the Treaty of Riga in twenty one sets the boundaries that neither neither um, state is happy with. Right. Right. So uh, I think I forgot so, your question. <laughs> not too much. Uh, I think you know, addressed in terms of spatial things. Oh, the spatial. Uh, yeah, 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 sorry, okay, yeah, so the spatial, yeah, the spatial, like, and then the um, yeah. Your second part of the question was um, the chronological. Well, yeah, kind of. Like, so yeah. I think sort of touched on that earlier, but just yeah. like partly. I mean, it, it, so, it, it, yeah. I mean, also I imagine the degree of the heritage. I mean, the failed insurrections, the successful ones, the sense of past glory, and I'm, and I'm sure. I mean, the kind of well, cultural cultural um, yeah, flowering and the right. contribution There's, contribution um, of Poland to plenty, measure, right. Plenty Many of uh, neo-romantic painters that are painting some of these scenes or scenes of, say, the Polish countryside meant to elicit some sort of romantic, neo-romantic national feeling. And um, probably the most famous, though, is uh, uh, a writer called uh, named Henryk Sienkiewicz, who wrote a trilogy, and it was a 19th century look at the 17th century so it's this stage of polish history which is at once it's it's a golden age in which one finds the seeds of its own decline and this uh in a way that americans read shakespeare um Schenkevich was also a real very masterful at, at polish um every writer is but him particularly uh, he's used as uh um, as an exemplar, his writing is used as, as t- to exemplify, say, maybe the best in terms of linguistic expression. Um, also, there was a, uh, a sort of a re a dedication to finding the, the older um, national Polish, like Mitzkevich, who the Lithuanians and even Belarusians would also end up claiming, and then Yulish Słowacki. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, in terms of the art, you know, um, yeah, there are. Uh, literary, artistic, and then when movies come, even even some of that, but um, uh, but that really provides a continuity. And so here we're getting into the nuance of the nationalists. We think that it's a genealogical link, but we can, with hindsight, look and say it's really this 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 uh, Poland that they're talking about that that's reflected. 
of uh, that is a reflection of say the 17th century is, is a construction it's yeah. yeah and in terms of how this gets like studied and like talked about even like now or like the kind of because the present gloss that impacts on how you know like within Poland I mean these issues or questions things I mean, I mean just wondering, like as, as, since it would seem I mean over the last you know, in terms of 20 years I mean since the end of the Soviet hegemony that I mean the for emergence into another, another nationalism yeah. I, 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 is that a kind of other but yeah, it, it, that, it, it, that yeah. looks at the same kind of areas at all? Or? Well, you know, a, a lot of it is um, sort of recapturing the history of, of and being able to tell the stories that they couldn't tell or couldn't tell honestly uh, in the Polish People's Republic. Uh, uh, Katyn, the Katyn massacre is one example, uh, but virtually the entire Pilsudski regime, which in some ways we can say is a... Um, um, counter to a lot of the really ugly national movements that we see in Poland is vilified because he's and he's a socialist who betrays socialism for Polish nationalism and is also then an, a, an enemy of the Soviet state so it both ideologically and then uh, pragmatically you know this the the Lublin government under direction under the direction of Moscow has a real problem then with um, any type of sort of success or so Polish intrinsic Polish identity connected to um, um, this this person so thing you know history is recast um, even in a way that it sounds absurd but even connecting some of the Polish independent movements to the Bolshevik Revolution because you need a you sure. know what you know in a way the state religion and they all have them uh, but to, to reconcile the narrative of what people believe with what the you know with what the Polish People's Republic needs them to believe so a lot of what's gone on recently is sort of a recapturing and I think that's uh, in the sense of you know telling the stories that couldn't be told before and I think this is why Norman Davies is enormously power power popular rather uh, and he would say things um, in his writing, uh, say God's Playground, in the early 80s, that the Poles couldn't say. Partly even condemning the West, that you know the Western powers abandoned Poland, you know this 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 trope. Um, and when the wall fell, uh, the books were translated into Polish. And uh, one of the Polish Jesuits I knew uh, was talking about his high school career. And he, he said that his history teacher who taught Polish history looked at Davies's book as his Bible. Hmm. <laughs> you know, so um, to tell you the truth, that's my I, I need to take a look at uh, those more current national narratives in the sense of uh, what is being taught in school. I mean, you mentioned, uh, I do know. Uh, in terms of some of the Jewish uh, issues, uh, after the um, uh, publication of the book Yedvabne by Jan Gross, mm -hmm. uh, that prompted a very serious response by the department, you know, the Ministry of Education in Poland, and there were aspects in the curriculum that were adjusted to include um, Jews and Judaism in Polish history, and before that, it, they were written out as part of the national narrative. You know, both in the PRL and then as the Third Republic came, that that historical amnesia just continued. You know, so uh, that's about the extent yeah. of my knowledge on that, sure. Jacob. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, of course. And I wanted to maybe like circle back towards the thing you asked me originally. I mean, the question of religion and, and Catholic mm -hmm. identity. I mean, since it seemed to indicate that, I mean, well, certainly yeah. for. I mean, most you know, societies are attempting to rebuild themselves after not, I mean, both extended colonialism, but also like just yeah. um, co you know, colonialism among separate areas like partition, which seems in some ways even more challenge for attempting to rebuild and renegotiate the sense of common economic, social, political, cultural set of um, So I mean, that the lingu yeah. I mean, it seems like as much as you know, like ling linguistic and you know, cultural you know, links of it, so that religion also, I mean, you know, it seems like it would be difficult to like overemphasize like how you useful as a I would agree. As, 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 I as, would a, agree. as a common reference like, they could say that I'm not treated you know entirely cynically but like even but even if no one in terms of had an issue of actual faith and belief in it, it would still be you know right. <laughs> absolutely crucial and, on and, and Brian, every level yeah. of mm -hmm. um, so I guess maybe also no, just as to, uh, just briefly like Brian Porter Such at the University of Michigan really deals with this t these types of issues and he calls this sort of public uh, engagement of Catholicism where people will participate uh, in 
you know, the rituals like the Corpus Christi procession and, you know, all this type of business, call themselves Catholic, keep Vigilia and all this, but not really believe any of the doctrine. There's really, and he calls this sort of ethno-Catholicism. And so, and in that way, that's something that's um, better, you know, manipulated by um, nationalists and, um, in a way, secular elites to um, help create a Polish identity in contradistinction to, say, German Protestantism or, you know, Russia or Ukrainian Orthodoxy maybe today against Russian Orthodoxy and the so-called secular West. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's a a very convenient tool. And, you know, for them um, to be, uh, to not listen maybe too closely to the bishops who might oppose them um, is also is also a good move. So if you're a, if you're a nationalist, you want people to claim Catholicism, participate in the ritual, but maybe not listen so closely to what their priests are saying. Right. Unless the priest is a nationalist, and unfortunately there are quite yeah. a few of those. So. Yeah, and yeah. I guess connecting to that, I mean, the sense of like how you know in terms of you know uh, Polish politicians and nationalists like saw the church and saw Catholicism and seemed you know very I mean it, it could be there you know, different ways in terms of questions like, like which church or like or like which yeah. variant of Catholicism or how much you know as the abstract you know as opposed right. to the right. tangible things if it has yeah, conflicting goals but also I guess the way that the church saw Poland or like the way that they I mean both Vatican and or different different levels of hierarchy since I mean it seems that as well it would have been like a significant investment in any way but as it, as historical events meant, it meant playing out the fact that Poland emerges reemerges at virtually the same time as the Bolsheviks uh, do I mean is it consistently in the sense of like a notion of like a bulwark or like launching head for dealing with the, what 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 I, is happening I, I, in Russia I, I, is, that, is that like pretty, yeah, pretty consistent I, I, I think so yeah I think um, and if Professor Pease is listening and would like to call in and correct me if he needs to I think that's uh, at least some of the sense that's conveyed in terms of the behavior of not only the Polish government but the Polish bishops they see themselves as the bulwark you know um, sort of of Catholicism and um, and some of the maybe the more xenophobic even civilization against the East um, this new book on uh, Independence Day that I've been reading um, the last couple of days by uh, this guy Bisco- Bis- uh, Professor Biskupski um, that he, he mentioned some overt references to that in some of the public speeches so yeah I think you're right that it um, and you know the irony is is that the church began to claim that it was the defender of you know the Polish nation and it was the one of the structures you know that allowed for the continuity of the nation um, when the government had you know closed shop in 1795 uh, but you can also see uh, Professor Peace points out you know that some of the at least the early uh, statements of some of these uh, church leaders was the, you know be obedient to the czar so you know they've got really good public relations that you know in the beginning they're like be obedient to the um, um, to um, the Habsburg monarchs or, or the or the czar by the end of the by the end of the century like we are Poland <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, yeah since, so. since I guess that's even you know, from the course of revolution th- show. I mean, they can be dangerous things. You don't mm-hmm. know. You don't know which idea yeah. will will flow in. And that's what, very true. That's what, that's what seems to make. I, don't know, I, I, I tend to think it's not that era to cover sort of as much, but I mean the whole context of the very late 1910s, early 1920s, yeah. are just like sort of f- fascinating. It's just I mean the amount of flux and sort of reinvention and challenge that was happening in, in, in North America, in Europe. I mean. F- virtually everywhere I mean it's I, I, I think it deserves to be like talked about and like referenced as much as we sort of do like the 1960s or the you know very early breakup of Soviet bloc for that matter in the late 80s um, I mean and also I mean just since you sort of hinted at this before in terms of the question of like both you know in terms of differing popes and different policies but also the question of who had you know access or like who had who had channels you could maybe yes. just like elaborate and like into the within the Polish you know, within the like Polish connection of like just partly like how like how tenuous or how fluid was that and like what were well um, Pilsudski's religion was Poland and uh, he really had he, he wasn't unlike the Domowski, who ran the Indetsia, Pilsudski didn't imagine himself a, a good Catholic. Uh, he had very little time for the church, really, other than how it could be um, useful for, um, as long as it didn't get in the way of, of uh, Poland. Domowski, on the other hand, who considered himself, uh, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't overstate that. He was uh, an atheist until he realized that Catholicism could mobilize Polish. Uh, ethnic the ethnic poles then suddenly the church was all that 
Um, but in terms of uh, Pilsudski, who is the um, say dominating force in Polish foreign policy, um, he how do I want to say this? He he's very interested that the church not get in the way of the success of the Polish state. And so there are some crisis moments in terms of trying to hammer hammering out the concordat that uh, Neil Pease talks about. Um, but also one of the ironies of history, right? History's not planned and it's not rational. Uh, at the same time that he's got some of these uh, difficulties, he is um, he is personal friends with um, Achille Arati, uh, Pope Pius XI. So a lot of uh, crises were averted by their and with their personal connection. Um, so on the one hand, there is a, and Pilsudski was sort of noted on that if you were, um, if you were a friend, you were a friend, you know. Um, in that way, so it's always dangerous to say, but he strikes me as a pre-modern man in the modern era, and I don't want to overstate mm -hmm. that, but there's a certain romanticism to him, and uh, he's trying in a way, I think, in terms of his person to retrieve an older sense of being Polish, although we know that that's not, possible but that's the way that he conducts himself and so these ideas of um, personal honor and connection and uh, manners and all of this are, are important to him and that plays out a little bit um, Domofsky not so much <laughs> so um, in terms of the access of power I mean kind of circling way back to the beginning with Dervin Nim uh, he really exploited that and be, you know because he in a lot of ways his views of Russia were uh, congruent with the views of Pius the, the 11th he did have access and and his access moved from being informal to formal to uh, a level of formality you always have different levels of distinctions in, in, in church theology or politics right so you know I always thought this was a little bizarre as a kid that you're different levels of perfection well how can something be more perfect than another but evidently you can make an argument for that uh, the same with levels of access and maybe to the Pope that there's um, informal access and various degrees of formal access and he had the highest in which he could avail himself uh, of the Pope without uh, an invitation for an audience and uh, he used his, he used that position in many ways to his own benefit Mm -hmm. um, and would essentially indicate to people that the ideas that he was proposing were the Pope's when in fact they were his own and he was uh, I don't know how quickly but that was that was discovered and let's just that that wasn't uh, uh, people were displeased about that and I in some ways uh, just instinctually I would say that that would probably have a lot to do I'm gonna, when I when I come through the archives I want to yeah. look for this type of stuff because uh, you know, um, I don't care who you are. I mean, if people feel they've been wronged and they have power, they can be pretty venal, whether they're wearing cassocks or suits, right? So, um, I want to I want to take a look at at some of that. Yeah, it also seems that in examining in terms of how this played out. I mean, just that also would be like we're talking about relevant stories, like the kind of expectations, or even or, even, or that even one could you know, in terms of doing a history on like kind of differing myths or 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 interpretations or, interpretations or like false tales about this. I mean, as you, you referred yeah. to earlier, I mean the notion of like well, might have had a, a woman on the side just run through, which right. just seems that you know, as you mentioned, a convenient. I mean, form yeah. of form of defaming since it points to yeah. not. I mean, not just violation of rules, but rules, but as a sort of like kind of common petty yeah. role way of doing it. Oh, but, absolutely. Or like, <laughs> or, or, I mean, similar even like you know, focus on like the espionage, Vatican espionage. I mean, yeah. points. I mean, I guess kind of you know, like or like secrecy or pe or perhaps people's general you know, like li liking of the notion of like collusion or behind the scenes maneuvering right. or like the attraction of conspiracy theories of whatever. Right. Form, like, right. What, 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 both what both cases where conspiracy exist and where they don't, but it, be, you know, it seems it becomes a way, of, way of, also a way of interpreting. Well, at the at the heart of this, you you picked up on it. Part of the downfall, of his uh, his dismissal in the fall of thirty three, comes on the heels of what what historians call the Debner affair. Now, this is fantastic, you know. Um, so, his secretary, the secretary for his commission for Russia, is um, this Father Debner. Father Debner is a Russian national who was an Orthodox priest who converted to Catholicism, whose aunt lived in, I think it was his aunt, but a relative who lived in the Kremlin. And um, 
he had and he he did do erratic things and he was in fact a person who did meet for a while um and we don't know what happened but uh had a relationship of some kind with a woman in germany so uh so here's this erratic guy who's got connections to um the kremlin <laughs> in indirectly and um and i don't remember the the chronology offhand but Earlier, I think it was the same year, I think it was earlier in 33, a bunch of Vatican documents went missing. Shortly after, Debner went missing. Mm. Uh, did he take them? Maybe, maybe not, but certainly, uh, say, uh, back to the, our, our diplomatic and foreign policy intrigue, the Italian government and the Polish government jumped on this and accused them. It was all over the papers all summer. Uh, there's no evidence, but you know it's a convenient um, sort of coincidence, right? Documents missing, Debner missing, Debner turns up later, um, no documents. Um, comes to Derbeni, Derbeni sends him off to a monastery and tells him to pray. It's all like very, you know, sort of murky, and uh, uh, I think that certainly did play a part in in uh, the dismissal. Um, whether that, but whether that ends up being a cause. But it certainly gives context to the fact that, you know, here's this man who's uh, uh, sort of not ingratiated himself to a great deal of the Roman Curia, um, sort of involved indirectly in this scandal. And that was all over the papers and encouraged by um, these foreign governments. So, you know, when you're talking about, you know, clandestine and, you know, defamation and all that, oh, it's right at the heart of some of this. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Well, that seems, like, that seems a charged uh, and interesting topic. And uh, thank you, Michael, for uh, talk, talking with him. Yeah. You know, with, and, with, and with Jacob, I, I do appreciate um, the invitation because, if anything, you've helped me clarify some thoughts and maybe see some of the weaknesses of what I have to think out a little bit more. So I really do appreciate the chance to, um, you know, talk about my project. Good. Yeah. <laughs> and I find it interesting to hear you hear a level of detail that probably wouldn't otherwise be exposed to in terms of its own knowledge of Polish history. Yeah. Is uh, very far from comprehensive in any sense, but in any case, um, so yeah, we wish a bit of luck with that, and look forward to hearing more about it. As hopefully you find you know, at least some answers, but I'm sure many, many more questions. Uh, okay, thank you across thank the you. archives. Again, uh, so thanks for joining us, and uh, thanks to everyone for listening to this. Uh, this has been Size of Thoughts: Conversations with the Alliance of History Graduate Students. Uh, thank you, and good night. <laughs>